Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. I'm Dan Joseph, and you are watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Live from Palm Desert, we're doing a show. It looks uh, like there's a golf course behind me. That's because there is, Dan, where uh, I love to do things on remote, whether I'm remotely uh, doing it or I'm sitting in your uh, in your house or whatever it is. Today, I'm uh, wrapping up a short break in Palm Desert, and it's just great to be in a sunny, warm place during the middle of winter. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm in Maryland, where it's cold, so... Um, you know, I, I envy you. That'd be nice to be. Yeah, it's nice. Hey, Ryan's got a great question to start us off. How do we get a signed copy of this thing? Oh. This book. Of this? Well, um, I guess I, I don't have a formal mechanism in place, but, you know, you could look at my uh, website, uh, which is danjosephauthor.net and contact me through there. And then, you know, we could arrange to have, you know, either mail me the book or if you live in the greater dc area maybe i could meet you up and give you a signed copy that would be best way to do it all right i'll put that in there and uh good job with the fast question hey so let's um oh and nick ash we got a question here in arabic and somebody clapping so we'll put that up there they're probably uh-huh. yelling at you in arabic but we'll talk about el shabab uh, in a few <laughs> minutes so dan writes books and dan like me is a complex dude so he likes baseball same he wrote a book about Lou Gehrig and his battle with ALS. It's something I'm passionate about. My buddy Phil Green has ALS. You also wrote a book about a guy named Pete Reeser from the Dodgers, mid-century, uh, 20th century, and just a fascinating character who was, his career was cut short in part by World War II, but also by his, uh, by his elan for the game and his desire to do things. So I guess I'm going to ask you a question you probably haven't been asked yet. When you look at all of the players in baseball, because you, you don't write books about baseball at this level because you don't love it. We often have the conversation about the color line as that being like a line of embarkation. But if you were to take Mike Trout and put him in 1939 AAA baseball, he wouldn't be the same dude because you wouldn't have access to the same kind of food, same, same kind of liberties and freedom that we have here in terms of financially everything. You might, Mike Trout might have a dad that's like, people in our family only deliver milk. That's all we do. That's all you're ever going to do. So every era has its challenges. What challenges were present for Pete Reeser that you think don't translate today that would be really hard for a baseball player to, to play back then? Well, Reeser grew up in you know, the heart of the Great Depression. Um, he quit high school when he was 15, maybe just about 16 years old, in part because well, he, he wasn't interested. He really just wanted to play baseball, but also his dad made him go get a job in a, uh, a paper factory where he was paid $16 per week. And that money was, you know, used to support the Reeser family. He came from a family which had 12 kids, uh, nine of whom I think survived into adulthood. So, that, you know, that money w- was crucial. Um, he also, you know, it, it's hard to appreciate how much competition there was for major league jobs at that time. Uh, the He originally signed with the St. Louis Cardinals, and the Cardinals had, depending on the year, somewhere between 20 and 30 farm clubs. And, you know, that means there were like 20 first basemen and 20 second basemen just in the system. It was really, really hard to get to the majors. So, you know, now Mike Trout probably would have zoomed right to the top anyway, because he had that level of talent. But there are a lot of players today who they might have been double A or triple A players for years on end because, you know, there were only 16 major league teams. There were hundreds of minor league teams. And. You know, you had, there, there were guys who existed in the minors for 15, 20 years, never really getting a shot at the major leagues. Right. That also wasn't a, a labor union. So you belonged to one team. And oh, yeah. if you belonged to that team, well, you had no ability to, 
So you could you could languish and and be held back for any number of reasons: talent, money, race, whatever it was. They, they were. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, go on. No, go ahead. No, you go. Oh, you're, they, you're, you're, they were guys. You know, like Lou Gehrig was the first baseman for the Yankees for. 15 years, and he never, of course, sat out a game. And there were good first basemen in the Yankee farm system who just didn't get a shot for years and years until they got traded to somebody else, until the Yankees decided, okay, you know, we, we, we realize we're not going to need you, so we'll trade you to the Browns, you know, or, or something like that, the St. Louis Browns. You, you really had – there was a luck – there was a much greater element of luck just to make the major leagues. You had to be in the right place at the right time. With someone like Pete Reeser too, there's the chicanery like between the Cardinals. You know, like if your team is a team that looks for and develops young talent that costs money um, and you're, you get picked up by the Cardinals and that also is super lucky because guys would run around in trains and look for factory level ball teams. But then even then he didn't end up on the Cardinals partly because of the things you're talking about where you might hide a player in some lower, you know, D level uh, minor league. Talk a little bit about his rise. Well, he got signed by the Cardinals um, supposedly when he was 15. He was too young to actually play in the minor leagues. So they kind of, he, he went around for a year or two with the Cardinals chief scout driving all over the South and the Southeast. Um, Cause the guy, the guy liked Pete and wanted to keep an eye on him. So he finally joined the Cardinal system in Class D ball in Newport, Arkansas, 1937. Little town of like maybe 4,000 people. Played one year there. Then Judge, the commissioner of baseball, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, decided the Cardinals were hoarding players, basically. And they, they were controlling more than one team in some leagues. He thought this was anti-competitive. So he released 91 players from the, car, from the Cardinal farm system. Uh, made them free agents, among whom was Pete Reeser. And he said they, these guys could not re-sign with the Cardinals. The Cardinals, though, who were then under the operation of Branch Rickey, uh, did not want to lose Reeser. So they made a sly, underhand deal with the Dodgers. You know, they, they, the Dodgers were going to stash Reeser in their system for three years and then trade him back to the Cardinals. But this is where uh, Pete's... Uh, pluck got in the way. He not only was he too good a player to hide, yeah. but he he talked himself into major league spring training in 1939. Uh, Leo DeRocher was the Dodgers' new manager, and he took a liking to Pete. And he put Pete in some exhibition games, and Pete got on base 11 times in a row. And all of a sudden, the New York press was like, "Who is this guy?" And uh, DeRocher fought to keep him on the major league roster. Larry McPhail, the Dodger GM, said, no, he's so young, he needs more seasoning. But really, the issue was that, you know, the Cardinals, he, he had promised, you know, he, the Cardinals that he would return Reeser. But then the, the glare of the spotlight got too great, and the Dodgers had to bring him up. Um, and they paid the Cardinals $132,000, Now, much of which was for the Cardinals outfielder, Joe Medwick, who was a former Triple Crown winner. But at least some of that money was to compensate the Cards for the loss of Reeser. But, you know, Reeser, because of this gentleman's agreement, he was held out of the major leagues for a year and a half. And, and you know, that was the kind of uh, control that uh, the owners and the teams had back then in those pre-union days. And when you look at his numbers, his first season in the big leagues, he's 21 years old, and he came up ready to go. Like, he he was, if not, not fully baked, he was, he was all dente. And so he was able to play at that level. If he came up a year, year and a half earlier, that really points to a potential Hall of Fame trajectory. I mean, teenagers in the major leagues have a tendency more often than players who are 22. that Once they get there, if they can thrive, they're so young, they play forever, they can compile. And they're so young and so good, they tend to be better than their peers who were three, four years older. Yeah. Yeah, Pete, you know, he could have probably made the major leagues in 1939. And, and that would have changed his career, he would have played four years before going into uh, the military for the war. And instead, he only got about two and a half. And this kind of put him at a permanent salary disadvantage when he got out of the war. Because uh, guys like Joe DiMaggio and Stan Musial, who Pete Reeser was compared to, they had much larger salaries coming out of the war. And Pete was still getting like $10,000 a year, which 
even in 1946, I mean, it was a good salary for the average American, but for a ball player with his talent, you know, just wasn't anything special. I want to get into Pete's style of play because it's important to another thing from that era, uh, not a lot of padding on walls and a lot of unprotected no. No. things, sprinklers in the field. Um, how about, I think about Mickey Mantle and getting an abscess on his hip in 1961. That wouldn't happen today. If you went in for a steroid shot, they would use a fresh needle. You know, if there was a problem, they get you on a course of antibiotics immediately and their, you know, star player wouldn't be, in the hospital as the team goes to the to the playoffs and it just doesn't happen anymore. So here's a guy that plays with reckless abandon and basically a drawer full of sharpened knives, you know, <laughs> compared to today's standard of safety, you know. That's a that's a good way of putting it. And you know, speaking of mantle, uh today a outfielder wouldn't break his foot on an outfield wall the way mantle did. Uh because I think he was playing in Baltimore and they had a chain link outfield fence and he caught his spikes on the uh, fence. I, I think that's what happened. But um, Reeser was playing in a really dangerous era when it came to outfield walls because there was zero padding other than maybe the ivy on the wall at a uh, Wrigley Field. Zero padding on the walls and all the walls were made out of brick or concrete. There was no warning track. And often there was an obstacle in center field, like a flagpole right. or like the monuments at Yankee Stadium. You know, you, right. could, you could trip right over Lou Gehrig's monument if you were going for a, a deep fly ball. Yeah. Um, there were uh, hills leading up to the fences. It, it was really kind of a danger zone out there and there was no warning track. Uh, so Pete slammed into the walls several times during his career and it definitely shortened his career he he got concussions like he later said you know it's funny he, he sometimes exaggerated things that happened to him he said he got skull fractures really what he got was multiple concussions um and then and during when he was playing during the war for an army team he ran through a hedge which, which, which sort of served as the outfield wall and on the other side of the hedge was a drainage ditch as, as deep as 25 feet deep depending on you know the telling and he aggravated he injured his shoulder basically he separated his shoulder and yet kept on playing because back then you know if, if the bone wasn't sticking out the manager told you you know get back out there we're, we're paying you for we're paying you to play yeah we're not, you know, yeah <laughs> Well, the, one of those sharp knives in that drawer that he was playing in was was his manager. It's like, hey, listen, I won't play you. I know you can't see straight right now. However, right now, now in this part of the game, I'm going to need you. And then, yeah, you had to play, right? You had to. That's what why that's why he was loved was that he would play no matter what with a broken ankle, with a skull fracture, <laughs> all these different things. Yeah, he was just game to be game. Yeah. Uh... There was Derosier was quoted at the end of the '46 season. '46, Pete had he hit the played with a separated shoulder, hit the wall twice, burned his hand on an oven, pulled a hamstring, all this stuff. And Derosier actually said at the end of the year, Pete Reeser. Now that's a guy who would have sacrificed an arm, a leg, uh, a hand, a head, a foot to bring this team a pennant. And he wasn't really exaggerating. Pete really did play with that disregard. It, it was a perfect storm in a bad way. Pete had disregard for his own health and he had a manager who admired him for playing that way. And, you know, and so Pete kind of wound up in the hospital way too often because uh, no, nobody was uh, using any restraint in, uh, in 1942. He hit the wall in St. Louis, bad concussion. The doctor told him, stay in bed. You're not ready to get up and play. But Pete was back in the lineup within less than a week. And he played the rest of the season with dizziness and headaches and double vision. And his batting average fell 50 points because, you know, the Dodgers wouldn't take it. The Dodgers fought a Pete as their ticket to the World Series. And uh, it didn't seem to occur to anybody that maybe a healthy center fielder was better than a guy staggering around with a double vision. When we look at these players that left money on the table, Joe Charbonneau, Dickie Thon, people like that that got beamed and, and taken out early, um, maybe Mickey Mantle is the best proxy where that truly great player 
that you know he blows his knee out before DiMaggio is even out of the out of the infield. Uh, he breaks his leg. All these things happen. Is there someone who's a better uh, corollary who actually does a little better? Because Mickey Mantle, I think, is pretty good because he got hurt a lot and mm-hmm. was you know a lot of time missed, but he still managed to put up 500 home runs, dang near a 300 average. Is there someone else who's like Pete at that level of quality of play? I, I've got a I've got a um, a section in the book. The book is called Baseball's Greatest What If, but I, I and that's Pete Reeser in my opinion. But there's there are certainly other great what ifs, and I have a section in there about some players who also had either career ending injuries or just circumstances killed their careers. There's um, a couple who Eric Davis of the oh, Reds yeah. in the 80s. Now that was a guy. Year and a half in the for the first year and a half of the major leagues, he had a fantastic blend of power and speed. But he he also hit a wall in Wrigley Field in '87, not nearly as bad as Pete, but he I think he missed like ten days, hurt his shoulder. But he was injury prone. You know, yeah. he uh, he was sliding for a catch and lacerated a kidney, and then he later got cancer. You know, it's, it's stuff like that. He he's a pretty good approximation. Um, there was a guy in the 1880s named Charlie Ferguson, who was a great two-way player, good pitcher, 20-game winner as a pitcher, 330-340 hitter, batting, but he died of typhoid when he was 25. Mm. Um, today, you know, it's really hard to think of a guy who even plays like Pete Weezer today. The, yeah, that was the next question, right? Yeah. The, the, the best, the two I can think of sort of are Cedric Mullins of the Orioles, Okay. Very a good power speed combination. Not maybe not the ceiling's not quite as high. And then a guy I love watching, Randy Rosarina of the Rays, who stole home during the was it during the playoffs. Um and Reason almost stole home game. in the World Series. He was like this short. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, he, yeah. he uh, that was Reeser's signature move, stealing home. And it's and Rosarina is a guy you just kind of never know you never know what he's going to do. Yasiel Puig actually would yeah. be another pretty good comparison. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm not yeah. sure he's even playing now. Is he, is yeah, he he's, he's uh, signed internationally. Um, one of the things about Yasiel is it's also his mental. Uh, I don't want to say incapacity, but his mental approach, not in terms of being a gamer for sure. That's part of it, but also just he just makes bad decisions in general in life and everything, uh, mm-hmm. things that piss off his teammates, whereas Pete Reeser's teammates, for the most part, love that guy. They they loved him, but I, I think as time went on, people who, his teammates and the Dodger management and some guys in the press started to wonder why he couldn't uh, pull back, why, why he, he had to run into the walls like this and, and injure himself constantly because – a little bit of restraint would have gone a long way. But, but you know, to, in fairness, Pete always said, you know, I had to play this way. This was the way God created me. God gave me this speed, those legs, and this was the only way I could play. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a major league player. That, yeah. that, that was his perspective on it, at least. And, and if the players were more expensive, there might have been a different attitude towards how they allowed him to play the game. You know, I mean, yeah. having a warning track, I mean, Dan, not even a warning track, right? No, no, no warning track. And, and, you know, and when he was in the, when he they, he put himself in the hospital with concussions, you know, and he would leave on his own accord. The, he would ignore the doctor's orders. But today, I guarantee you, no team would put him back in the lineup two, three days later and, and proclaim him okay. They, they would, you, you know, I think now you have to go through concussion yeah. protocols have and... To. Yeah, you wind up, some guys wind up sitting for a month. And that's what they should. Pete, one time, one time he got to sit for a month. That was after he slammed into the wall at Kevin Field and was given the last rites of the Catholic Church in the clubhouse because yeah. he was bleeding so badly. Uh, that, and then the Dodgers let him sit down for about six weeks. But yeah. and, then, and, and then, and you know, and he came back and he hit about 3.30 the rest of the season when he came back. D- double vision and all. Yeah. Justin Morneau comes to mind. You know, he dives back into a bag, takes a knee off the noggin, and uh, he shut down really for like, honestly, for about 18 months. I mean, he didn't play basically the rest of that season and was severely incapacitated for a lot of the next season. 
you know, and it just took him a long time to ever to get back. And he got back to a pretty high level, but you could say he never even got all the way back. And and with Pete, I mean, you, <laughs> this guy goes to the world. He goes to World War II and then gets hurt as a baseball player there, talking about like, "Hey, back off! You're in the army. It's okay to yeah. let that one go over the wall or off the yeah. head." <laughs> yeah. He, uh, the army, army was an interesting experience for him because, you, you know, he was on the verge of becoming a real superstar, a really well-known name. Uh, and he missed three prime years. And I mean, I, there was a little bit of bitterness, I think, after the war that he missed that time and that he missed out on his, his salary rising yeah. uh, during that time. Uh, but you're right. He he didn't back off during the war. Um, it's in the book. I don't want to give away too much of the book, but there yeah. there was, um, well, there was that incident I said where he ran through the hedge, and there was another time he slid so hard into third base he pulled the uh, the base right out of the ground and it's it flew away ten feet. And I, I found a picture of him. He was playing in Louisiana in 1945. And he's about to do one of his hard slides. Actually, he did it like a fadeaway slide into home mm-hmm. plate. There, you could see in the background, there's nobody in the stands. I mean, he might have been playing for a few hundred soldiers, if anybody, but he's still playing hard to win. He just there was no uh there there, there was no second gear. It was it was either on or off. And mo- when he stepped onto a field, it was on all the time. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I can't think of another player that's been carted off the field as many times as he was. And this wasn't for show. This is a guy who's literally knocked out about to get last rights 12 times. I think it was in the book where he's been carted off the field. You know, he was, um, that, now that's what sports writers said. He was carted off 11 times. Now I couldn't find 11 times where he was actually stretchered off the field. I found probably there were at least 11 where he had to leave a game because yeah. he had, some kind of injury, not always a concussion, not, not always hitting a wall. So one time he got hit in the face by a ball and that was one of his concussions. He broke his ankle a couple times. Uh, but here in the book on page 108, 106, I've got a handy dandy chart of all the times Pete Reeser hit the wall and all the, you know, his major collisions. Yeah. Uh, and one of which was in an exhibition game, incidentally, a preseason <laughs> exhibition game. Yeah, the the Dodgers were playing the Yankees and losing ten nothing in the sixth inning. But when Charlie Keller of the Yankees hit a ball to center field, wham! Pete slam Pete went right after it, slammed into the center field wall. He just R- Ralph Branca said he would do it in batting practice too. He could not. Uh, it, 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 a sports writer named Jimmy Cannon wrote a long essay actually once on on uh, how Pete seemed to how he said it was a wild and frightening beauty when Pete Reeser was going after a ball because it was such a pure act of uh devotion toward catching this fly ball but the danger was there you know as he got closer and to to the wall fans would shout out you know you're getting close wall he didn't seem to hear it it was a a tragedy in a way yeah it is a tragedy and it's a tragedy that you can't find someone who can get their head wrapped around how to get him to, to back off a little bit. You're not supposed to be knocking yourself out in exhibition yeah. games. And one of the stories I read was that he was going for a ball that was possibly going to go over the fence and does, and he still craters himself into the wall on a ball that's not even catchable, you know? And so, so he's paying a cost. It's not like he's holding the ball up in his hand. He's just running like there is no consequence. And and he's going to run until the ball is no longer catchable and he's yeah. passed out on the ground. That, that, I mean, that sounds – now, you've probably seen the baseball movie The Natural with uh, Robert yeah. Redford. And, and there's a scene in there like that. And apparently that that guy who ran through the wall, that, that was inspired by Pete Reeser. Although, although I don't think Pete ever ran through a wall. He ran through a, the hedge, but he never ran through an actual wall. And, and when he was going back to the ball, you know, it's funny. He did have enough judgment to go after the ones he could catch. Um, he either, when he hit the wall, he either caught the ball or at least got his glove on the ball. It, it was uh, it was close every time. He never, actually, I don't think he ever actually chased the ball into the stands. Uh, there was never like a Turner Ward incident. Remember that guy from the Pirates who yeah. who ran 
ran through all, you know, and I contrast him in the book with Ken Griffey Jr. Mm, okay. Griffey approached the wall in so, you know, we, we all remember him for his acrobatic catches, but he was much smarter around the wall. He, he was very aware of where the wall was and how he, of course he had padding by then, you know, he had no padding, but right. Griffey knew to how to play the padding. He would put his arms up like in the famous Spider-Man catch to, you know, brace himself on the wall, completely different style. And, and then so right. Griffey played 21 years and Pete, Pete really only played, he only had four years where he was a regular because of uh, all the accumulated injuries. Right. But he was an all-star in those four years. I mean, he is his, his uh, if you want to use war as a measure, um, he was there. But even then, he only played, what, two-thirds or less of a season in his four good seasons? He played in, in 41, which is his, his fantastic season where he led the National League in just about everything. He played just about the whole schedule. I think he might have missed like 15 games. And then the other years, he was missing like 20, 30, 35 games, uh, but was still functioning more or less as the Dodgers' regular center fielder or sometimes left fielder. Um, and then after 1947, when he broke his ankle in the World Series, he was just – after that, he was just too banged up to play uh, – Regularly, he he couldn't go more than a few games without having either uh, dizziness issues or his shoulder hurt too much or his ankles hurt too much. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, it is a what if story. So let's say that he was 10% more cautious and ready to hang on until the World Series. Um, I, I'll just I'll just throw this out there. Probably plays for the Dodgers a lot longer. And all of those Dodger teams that were near misses in the World Series all of a sudden become a little more possible because you got a guy who's one of the best players in the league out there. I mean, it's his uh, his passion ultimately caused the team a lot of damage in terms of long term career wise, uh, in terms of uh, impact. But what do you think? What? How do you answer the what if? Well, you know, he came up with, he came up with the Dodgers the same year as Pee Wee Reese, nineteen forty, and Reese played, you know, Hall of Fame shortstop. Reese played with the Dodgers until 1958, and he was like the pennant winner. He was the starting shortstop on seven, eight pennant winners. Right. And Pete could have played that whole time. Pete could have been one of the boys of summer uh, in the 1950s when the Dodgers were, you know, always coming up short in the, in the World Series. Um, and a healthy Pete Reeser would have given the Dodgers even a better offense. And, you know, and the Dodgers in those years were always short a left fielder. They, they constantly were looking for a guy in left field and, and Pete Reeser presumably would have been it, or maybe Duke Snyder would have played left field and Pete played center. So those, those teams might've been a little bit greater and it's, it's entirely possible that the Dodgers would have won the World Series before 1955. And I, mean, I don't know if it changes so much that the, that the Dodgers stay in Brooklyn, but uh, it, Dodger history, I think, would have unfolded quite a bit differently if, if Pete had stayed healthy. Yeah, I mean, the guys they had planned. It would have been like having two Jackie Robinsons, because Robinson and Reeser were very similar, similar in terms yeah. of their baseball ability. High average, very aggressive base running, moderate power, a lot of doubles and triples, and some home runs, and both, both of them were spark plugs. So you would have had two of those. Yeah, you would have two of those, and and the guys playing left field, you're not just Algie and Frito, but but it's guys who are like, who can we put out there? And it's more like a defensive thing or a, a bat that's not a well-rounded player like Reeser. It was always some kind of a compromise uh, in left field for the Dodgers. And yeah, you have a guy that can hit laser beams all over the outfield, run like crazy, steal home. I mean, can you imagine having two threats that steal home on your team? Oh. You, the other team would just spend so much energy just trying to prevent that from happening. Yeah. You have like Reezer on first and Robinson on third, and, and the pitcher is, is going to have a meltdown, I would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, – I guess let's go to Lou Gehrig next. Let's talk about that book. Um, everybody should definitely go over. I'm having some electrical problems over here. Something happened. The power went out. But um, get get Dan's book right there on the screen. There's the link for it. Go to Amazon and buy that. Buy any of Dan's books there. That would be great. Also, to support the Break It Down show, you can always go to breakitdownshow.com. Go to the PayPal link. 
Just click that and then put a little bit of money in each month. Consider it your own subscription. And we don't need Patreon. I need you and me, and we'll work together. You guys know how hard I work. The money goes right back into the show. I'm going to buy some new equipment this week with some of the money that others have donated. Uh, it's buying ads. It's making the show grow. That's how you keep the show healthy is by going to breakitdownshow.com and clicking on that PayPal link or just email me at peterbreakitdownshow.com and I'll send that to you. And if you love baseball books, uh, Dan is a guy that writes fascinating ones. So my, my buddy Phil has ALS. And I know when we were first starting on this journey together, he's like, I got this weird thing. My muscles are twitching. And I, you know, I just don't know what it is. And it took, I'm going to say, the better part of a year to eliminate everything else. Because that's how you determine what ALS is. Is you like, okay, well, it's not blood cancer. It's not this. It's not this. All that's left is, is ALS. So Lou Gehrig, in his last productive season before he had to shut it down, you know, early in the, uh, was it 39 season? He, um, he for sure was feeling the impacts of this. We don't think about that, but a year, six months before that, he's not doing as well. There's, can we see that in the statistic record? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, for a decade, Lou was a guy who reliably hit 35 to 40 homers a year, batting average usually somewhere in the 350, 360 range, tons of RBIs, and of course, never missing a game. And then in 1938, his production dropped off pretty sharply. You know, and, you know, he was starting from such a high level. For him, it was a bad year, but for anybody else, it would have been a fine year. He still hit 29 homers, still drove in 114, still hit 295, still played in every game, still was getting, you know, a lot of doubles and maybe not so many triples, but um, he was still a quality major league baseball player, even though he sensed during that season, things were, something was going wrong in his body. Um, one of the things I uncovered for the book was a quote just before the season started where a New York post writer said, you know, Hey, you, you have the highest batting average on the team during spring training. And, and Lou said, well, yeah, I, I didn't realize that. That's great. But, you know, funny thing, I, I can't drive the ball. I'm getting I'm hitting singles. I, I, I my power is gone and I, I, I got to find out what's wrong with my hitting. Um, and then through most of that season, he struggled to get his batting average much above 270. Uh, he was striking out more than normal. He was not hitting very many home runs. Um, and then. Observers at the time were saying, hey, he looks slow in the field. The, you know, pitchers were blowing the ball by him, and he, he does, he's not covering much ground at first base. Um, August of 38, he had what may have been a temporary ALS reversal, or at least a plateau of some kind. Mm -hmm. He had, all of a sudden, he got his home run streak, home run stroke back, and he hit, what was it, like? In a span of 14 games, he had like seven homers, 27 RBIs. Yeah, for for month, month, right. month for the month of August, he was hitting really well. And he played in the Yankees at one point played six doubleheaders in a single week. And he played all 12 games, all nine innings of all 12 games. Um, and then after that, that maybe that took a little something out of him. For the rest of the season, he was mainly a singles hitter. He actually, you know. He adapted. He turned himself into a guy who got a lot of singles and walks, and he was still helping out the Yankees to win, but he wasn't doing it in the traditional Lou Gehrig style. He had kind of turned into Ichiro Suzuki in a way. Mm. Um, and then by the World Series, it, you know, he, he played in the World Series that year, and the Yankees won it four straight, but he got nothing but singles, and again, people thought he looked slow. Um, mm. And then 39, he got to spring training and just it was evident that something drastic was going on because he could not hit, he could not field. He he was doing it more on memory and guile rather than you know his power and reflexes. He he would hit, he could hit singles, but balls that should have been doubles or triples, he could only run to first base. And you know, he could catch the ball at first base, but he had, he just, he couldn't move to his left. He couldn't move to his right. It, it was just evident that his time was up. Um, I still think the 38 season is the most amazing that the, the most amazing season in baseball history in a way, because this was a man beginning to suffer from a deadly disease 
and he still played the whole season and played pretty well. He played really well. I'm looking at the numbers right now. And in a, in a season, and by the way, when you're looking at somebody, this is in, you know, the 30s, and he's in his 30s. He's 35 years old 35. in his last good season. And so if a guy started to lose his power and lose his stroke, that's fine. He still hit 29 home runs. And, and you know, like you're saying, he, he was, um, his OPS was 900 plus if you're into that kind of thing. And if you're not, let me just tell you, that's not just all-star caliber. That's best player in the league caliber, you know, play. And this is a guy that's literally dying. I think it's interesting about ALS is that um, you can't just will your way through it. If you work out and think, I'm going to keep my muscles strong, what you do is you break down the muscle and it can't cover. And so if you don't move, you lose and you atrophy and you lose the ability to keep muscle that you have. If you work the muscle too hard, you'll break the muscle down and it won't regenerate because the uh, the neurodegenerative nature of the disease and so if, if you wanted to pick something you didn't want to do, it would be play a hard season of championship level baseball and mm -hmm. then, you know, try to <laughs> try to recover because it's just not how ALS cooperates. Yeah. The, the, the adaptations Lou made during the season, that was interesting to learn about because um, he switched to a lighter bat mm. uh, as the season went on. Last week of the season, Jimmy Fox, who was uh, the, the Boston Red Sox first baseman, gave Lou a bigger glove to use at first base to help him catch uh, throws. Um, and he changed his batting stance. He, he actually he fiddled around with the batting stance for most of the season, and then he finally found one that worked for him. And that, that was when he had the uh, hot streak in August. And, and I've also read that hot weather is good for ALS patients, and so maybe that helped him. I, yeah. it, it's a little bit of a fluke. I, I mean, I, I do wonder how he managed to have this incredible, because those three weeks, if you chart it statistically, that's like a skyscraper sticking out on a season. During those three weeks, his uh, OPS was like 1472 or something like that. It was, um, it, it was really incredible. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you see that and you, and you see the constant progression and he had to have known like, hey, there's something really seriously wrong with me. Did he have a thought like after the season, I'm going to go to ultimately the Mayo Clinic and get looked at or was he starting to process of figuring this out with doctors during the season? During the winter of 38-39, uh, I uncovered a couple of instances where it sure sounds like he was wondering aloud what's what's going on here. Um, he actually did a public service announcement for polio for, you know, the, the March of Dimes and the, and the, and the, uh, the, what was then the campaign to find a vaccine for polio. Right. And it's hard to imagine, you know, he sees a paralytic disease and, you know, he, maybe he feels like this is happening to him. So he, he wants to get involved in this. And then um, he gave a speech where he said, it was something like, you know, I know they're calling me an old man, but I don't have any whiskers yet. He said, he said I don't need a wheelchair or a cane yet, yeah. which really leaps off the page, you know, in retrospect. Yeah, because um, that was coming for sure. Yeah, it was. Um, it, but I think it wasn't until he got to spring training in 1939 that it became undeniably crystal clear that he was experiencing some kind of physical ailments that was taking away his abilities. And he couldn't, he couldn't chalk it up to age or lack of training for a while. He tried, he tried to say, well, I'm out of shape. I've gained some weight. I'm not jogging like I used to, but you know, at, at, it reached a point where he could no longer fool himself. And mm. the Yankees, mm. were, the Yankees were telling his teammates were grumbling apparently that he was not, the player he used to be in and, and they couldn't win with him in the lineup anymore. I want to put up uh, here the ALS cure project uh, and Phil green and the work he's doing as an ALS patient um, to, be, to pay, pave the way for the next guy to, uh, to deal with this. So this is the Phil green episode. If you guys are interested or just go to youtube.com Pete Turner, Phil green, you'll find it. But, uh, the thing to realize is that this disease is an individual disease too. And so how it represents for me or for Dan or for Phil is going to be different. 
And so it's, it's a very tough thing to solve because you're trying to solve an infinite number of variations of, of a disease that just doesn't behave in a way that we want it to. And he didn't even to test for it yet. You, you just end up with it when everything else is no longer the possibility. And since we have this opportunity to mention ALS, uh, listen, Phil Green is the guy. If you have someone in your family that you think might have this or you're trying to figure out what to do, let me know. I'll connect you to Phil. There's a powerful community. They're all working on this. These folks are lobbying Congress and trying to get rights, you know, because it's a, because of the nature and the speed of the disease. It's very hard for them to make progress because they often die before they can finish the work. Lou Gehrig dies just, I mean, on, on par with the standard death cycle. I mean, I think it's three years end to end from his, you know, basically getting it and it's showing up in his game until he's He's gone. It moves fast. So uh, check out that Phil Green episode. But yeah, so once once we realize that he's not going to play baseball anymore, and that happens in 39, how does, I know we've heard the speech, but when you look at the other stuff, the behind the scenes, the letters, whatever it is that you're reading, how does Lou take this news? Well, dur- during the 38th season, he had been experiencing a lot of the private stress uh, about the, the decline in his performance. And when he found out what it was, I think maybe in a way it came as a bit of a relief because at least he finally knew what was going on. Uh, his wife, Eleanor, she had suspected the, that he might have a brain tumor. And, uh, you know, obviously it wasn't that. Um, and then she tried to maintain the fiction for him that, you know, he might remain sick, but he would plateau at some point and he would continue to live with the disease. And she kind of conspired with the doctors at the Mayo Clinic to sort of keep up this ruse for Lou. But apparently he knew that there was no um, recovery from it and that he probably was dying. Uh, he, he said that to one of his teammates, I think in August of 39. Um, and he just he he lived with it as best as he could. He actually he tried to stay active. Um, in thirty nine, you see him making quite a few radio appearances and appearing in public fairly often, trying to maintain uh, appearances to some extent. And even as late as nineteen forty, he was still doing that. Uh, and then somewhere around the middle of forty, I think it got. And of course, oh, he had a job with the city of New York as a parole officer, uh, sort of to keep himself busy. And then I think as 1940 and then 41 went on, it just became harder and harder for him to leave the house. And, um, uh, you know, he, he dealt with it as best as he could, but it, it's so hard to, just, yeah. especially when he was such a big, powerful oh. uh, athlete. So, you know, all that glory and, and then it's just taken away very suddenly. It, it must have been hard, harder probably than he let on. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, Phil is a fantastic athlete. He was, uh, you know, maybe in another time, he might have been a professional soccer player. He's a national championship football player. And and these guys, especially back in, in Lou's day, the ability to have all the things that they have now, plastic, for example, a great tool for providing for someone of Lou's size, you know, to get him slid over from here to there and all the different ways that they can, they can provide some kind of normalcy. I, I've traveled mm-hmm. with Phil and cared for him. And uh, first off, your dignity is, is dropped tremendously. And just to travel takes a lot of dedicated effort, it takes somebody else. You're, you're a two person team and mm-hmm. it's a lot of work. And, and there's, if you choose to, there's a lot of shame in it where you're like, I can't even, you know, fill in the blank. And it's a lot of things feed myself like what a basic thing you go from being on top of the world in in new york city winning championships to not being able to run a fork and knife or tie your shoes or button your shirt these are simple things that an athlete of his caliber it must have been really hard to process yeah yeah he um uh babe dahlgren who took his place at first base told a story about lou came to yankee stadium on opening day 1940 and he asked for a smoke because, you know, it's funny, though, even as Lou was dying, he still continued to smoke cigarettes. And, you know, Dahlgren lit a cigarette for him. And, and, but Lou couldn't take it with his hands. He had to sort of reach out with his mouth and take it. And, and Dahlgren, I think, said he wanted to he wanted to run and cry because yeah. it was just such a, a stark difference to the Lou he had known one year earlier, <laughs> a few months earlier. 
Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. He and of course back then those days they didn't have motorized wheelchairs and right. and things that could have made life much easier for for Lou. But he, you know, he held up with with all the dignity that he could muster. He would continue to go to the stadium and sit with the Yankees in the dugout in his suit. Uh, he did kind of you know remain part of the team. Um, one year after his famous July 4th speech uh, at Yankee Stadium. He was back at Yankee Stadium. This isn't generally well known. Now, he didn't. He wasn't making a speech. This time, he was flying over the stadium in a blimp. Uh, <laughs> a, a, some friend of his arranged for Goodyear or somebody to you know, fly him over the stadium the, ne- the next year. Um, and he would still appear on the radio. Actually, I, I, there was a, he was on a radio show with a guy named, a, a comedian named Edgar Bergen and his dummy, Charlie McCarthy, who were very, very popular. And, you know, Lou was like a year away from death, and he has ALS, which often takes away the ability to speak. Speak, from yeah. ALS guys. But Lou, you know, he handled it no problem. He sounds pretty much like his normal self, even though by this point he couldn't even move his hands anymore. Right, right. It's a crazy, crazy disease in that it's paralytic, but you're you're not actually paralyzed. You just can't compel your body to move so you still if you jam a fork in someone who's got als is you know if you jam a fork into their hand they'll they'll feel it mm-hmm. and and so it's uh you have no control and again as a an elite athlete someone nimble and you know at the apex of any player around him that's just that had to be uh a lot to sort out for the or for, for lou yeah. how did his life carry on afterwards was it a relief once he was gone and she was able to move on or how did she do uh, apparently, you know, she lived for more than 40 years after he died, and she was always Mrs. Lou Gehrig for the rest of her life. She, I'm, I'm not sure she ever developed like a separate identity. She would come to Yankee Stadium for old timers games and things like that. For some reason, she got involved in the All America Football Conference, which was a, a rival to the NFL in the late 40s. Yeah. Uh, but mainly, she was Mrs. Lou Gehrig and taking part in like various fundraising campaigns and, and things like that. And uh, I, I guess I, I get the impression she was lonely, uh, maybe with a little bit of a drinking problem. Cause you know, at, after you're married to Lou Gehrig, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just imagining no other guy could possibly, you know, live up to that. No, nobody, other, nobody else could match that. I, I know he's universally loved, you know, but also because how, how he was afflicted, is there a darker side to Lou that has been washed out of history because of his affliction and his overall nice demeanor? No. Uh, to the <laughs> best of my knowledge, no. I mean, he, no. He, Good. He, he enjoyed smoking. He enjoyed a beer now and then. Yeah. Um, he did some things that today we would look at and go, what are you doing? Uh, yeah. Like one, one time, you know, he, his parents were from Germany. And... Um, in 1935, when the Nazis were in power, he went to Germany. He went to Nazi Germany, but not he didn't do like a Charles Lindbergh thing and, and cozy up to officials. He was just there visiting relatives. Today, people would ask, why, how could you go you know, at all? How could you do that? Um, but there was no malice. No, there was no he wasn't signaling sympathy for anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, no, I. There was no dark side. He was a mama's boy. He was an extreme mama's boy, and had a very hard time breaking away from his mother to get married. Yeah, um, that's about the worst of it, as far as I think anybody has ever been able to tell. And, he, and this is a guy. There have been several biographies written about him, and if, if no dirt's come up by now, I don't think it's there. It doesn't exist. Yeah. One of the other interesting things about him is he's he's a pioneer in that he went to college first. This wasn't the normal path for players, um, and it certainly is a very common path now. But you know, why would you go to Columbia and then go play a game? Especially if you got like these immigrant parents, are like, go become a doctor. <laughs> but yeah, turns out he's a good ball player. He kept going. He his his mother really really wanted him to go to college. And she was, I think, working at a fraternity house. She was like, you know, cooking and cleaning at a fraternity house at Columbia. She met the, the athletic director and he encouraged Lou to come out. And they, they kind of pushed him through a bunch of remedial classes so he could make it. You know, Columbia, Ivy League school. And he, he was just a, 
English wasn't even his first language. He grew up speaking German first. Yeah. Uh, and grew up coming from a, a not well-educated family, and but you know, Columbia really wanted him for the baseball team and football. He played football too. Um, so they kind of pushed him through Columbia and he got through two years and then he realized this is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be an engineer. I'm not going to be an Ivy league graduate. So the Yankees offered him, I want to say a thousand dollars, something like that to sign. Um, what's funny is that the Yankees at the same time offered a catcher, a famous catcher named Mo Berg, who was, Mo Berg, who was like, you know, Famous for speaking ten languages, but not able to hit in any of them. They they offered him like four times as much to sign yeah. with the Yankees, but um, yeah, Lou took whatever bonus they offered him, and he was in the majors re- really within. They they gave him his first taste of the majors that season, and he was their regular first baseman uh, yeah. about two years later. Yeah, Mo Berg's great story. Uh, the you know he was a catcher, but basically a professional third catcher, and and like you said, could speak a lot of languages. Was probably the smartest guy in his clubhouse, uh, mm-hmm. which is a good good enough transition for us. Let's get into this last book. How do you go from Lou Gehrig and Pete Reiser over to writing about Al Al Qaeda and and Al Shabab and how they uh, partner together? Well, okay, it's actually see, it's actually the other way around. I I wrote the Al Shabab book first. Um, I work. Uh, my day job is with Voice of America, okay. and uh, I work on the Africa desk in the central newsroom. And for a number of years, I've been writing articles about Al Shabab uh, with a guy in uh, VOA's. So, for those of you who don't know, Voice of America is U.S. government-funded news service broadcast in like 40, 45 languages around the world. It originated during World War II, and then was very instrumental in broadcasting to the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Now we broadcast like mainly to Africa and Asia, and Latin America. So anyway, we've been writing articles about uh, the Somali terrorist group Al Shabaab, and I told you, Haroon Marouf, very very good journalist, very connected, very professional. And I told him, hey, if you ever want to write a book about Al Shabaab, I'm in. I'd like to do it with you because I, I developed a certain fascination with this group because. They were and still are a little bit more disciplined and focused than the average terrorist group. They, they they are not just out there shooting places up and blowing stuff up. They actually seem to have a goal in mind to establish a real Islamist government in Somalia, very much like the Taliban in Afghanistan. And they, they were actually there was contact between the Taliban and Al Shabaab and between Al Qaeda. And Al Shabaab, and even Bin Laden himself, and Al Shabaab. And so Harun and I spent about three years um, researching all this and digging up a lot of uh, like U.S. diplomatic cables. And um, he he had done a lot of interviews of people who were in Al Shabaab. Uh, there were a lot of U- U.S. court cases against Al Shabaab figures because some of these guys came from Minnesota. Uh, they had joined their, they, a lot of them were lured over to Somalia. Somalia and Ethiopia were fighting kind of a war at the time. And a lot of them were lured over to Somalia because they wanted to fight the Ethiopians. And then, you know, and Al-Shabaab was fighting the Ethiopians, but then it sort of transitioned into this pure Islamist ideology fight. Uh, and that's when the, the U S got involved and, uh, the African Union got involved. So that book came first. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, Al Shabaab, it sounds a little bit like a guy who would be a first baseman for the Mets, but it has nothing to do with um, with baseball. It, it, it's just a completely different area of interest in my life. Yeah, we we tend to compartmentalize things and specialize in one. But uh, I think guys like us, we like to look around at the different things and when you start to dig into Al Shabaab or Al Qaeda or any, you know, fill in the blank terrorist group, you start to really realize what a terrorist group is and what it is not. Um, what what did you learn about Al Qaeda and or Al Shabaab that kind of informs how you see things going forward for other groups when groups are talked about? Well, Al Shabaab, you know, now their their leadership has completely turned over as the years went by because. 
so many of their guys were taken out in U.S. drone strikes. Um, but I think the core mission remains in, in that they would, if they could, still set up a Taliban-like state in Somalia and, you know, impose the restrictions on women and children's education and and little things like, you know, the length of beard that men are supposed to wear and men and women going out in public and music. You know, they, they, they're, when they were controlling Mogadishu, which is the capital of Somalia, for a while, they were banning any music played on the radio. Um, it, it's, it's almost textbook, you know, Islamist militant type thinking, which hasn't gone away as yeah. far as I can tell. Uh, so I, th that's probably what we will continue to see in Somalia. That so, although they're never, they've never been strong enough to take over the country. They've tried to push uh, the African Union forces out of Mogadishu. Came very close a couple of times, but never. They've always lacked the um, the heavy equipment. They don't have the tanks and the air force and the armored vehicles to defeat uh, Amazon, which is the African Union force there, to, to defeat them in, in battle. They, they've, they've taken them on in head, you know, head on head battle and they lost. So unless the African Union force was to leave, probably we're gonna see years and years of the stalemate, which really has been going on in one form or another for 13 or 14 years now. It's a, uh, it's it's a bit of a quagmire, quagmire. <laughs> and it's a quagmire that apparently we need to be in because uh, these places that are trying to fight off the Al Shabaabs of the world, and and um, ah, this isn't a political statement, but it's pretty hard on one side or the other. And when, when we champion um, hijabs, headscarves as some kind of symbol of freedom, you're also not talking about a place where the length of your beard and your ability to go to school and a flash of hair might all get you beaten to death um, publicly. So we, we've got to work on why we go do these things and how we do it, but also understand that, and if, if not us, who does go and provide fuel, training, weapons, whatever it's going to be, because uh, it doesn't take much for, for those kind of Al-Shababs to mestastize and, and grow. And next thing you know, you're dealing with, we had a guy named Tim Furnish on the show a bunch of times. We love to talk about the return of the Mahdi and how many times that has happened. And you just need a little bit of fuel and a little bit of willingness because folks are waiting for that to happen. And if you get that charisma in there with that fuel and that willingness, boy, oh boy, you end up with a really, really nasty problem. And that's why we have to deal with a lot of these things, at least on a small scale in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Somalia has never had a really charismatic leader. Al-Shabaab has never had a really charismatic leader who can kind of rally the country around him and, and either bring the country together for good, you know, like, like maybe, uh, you know, just like a, 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 some charismatic, like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a cult leader almost mm -hmm. yeah. or, or for bad. Um, and maybe that's a good thing uh, in Somalia's case and in, in these other countries. You know, because you, you, the last thing you want is a uh, a figure, not a figurehead, a, a, just a, a personality cult leader who would make people yeah do things that are counterproductive to that country's interests and to the world's interests. A, a Bin Laden type guy, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And those guys don't stop showing up. They're they're always out there. They're always looking for that next thing, wh whoever or wherever they are. They're always competing for that. And if they can turn the people towards their goal, I mean, I'm telling anybody who's listening right now, if you think that there's not an active drive from someone somewhere in the Islamic world to create a caliphate, you're wrong. Because that is absolutely a stated goal. And you don't have to be an extremist to, to want a caliphate. So it's really fascinating and challenging work to wrap your hands around what, what is dangerous and what is not. Um, it's just like with China. China's got an enormous problem. They've got an exploding middle class. It's bigger than the entire population of the United States. And those folks need to be provisioned to keep it stable. And if you don't, then you have a real problem if you're China or mm -hmm. the rest of the world. So all of these things aren't, aren't just black and white. They are not even shades of gray. They're extremely complex. 
And often yeah. one little thing can trip it good or bad. And, and we don't know what that's going to be. Yeah. Everybody should get Dan's books. As you can hear, he's super knowledgeable, whether it's Al Qaeda, Pete Reiser, or Lou Gehrig. Uh, it's just been a great to talk to you, man. Super interesting. You got topics that I love talking about. I love baseball. I got a Dodger hat on now. Um, I'll be thinking about the Dodgers and Giants and A's all probably all morning long. As hopefully we get some baseball coming in. Those are my basic closing comments. What are yours? Well, then just thank you for having me on the show. It was nice to talk. You know, you know, lately I've been talking a lot about Pete Reiser, and it's nice to kind of talk about the whole breadth of uh, of my work. Uh, I'm starting to work on another book. Uh, this is about a Pittsburgh broadcasting legend named Myron Cope, who was the creator of the term, uh, the creator of the terrible towel, which, you know, Steeler fans uh, whirl around the gold towel. And he, he coined the name uh, Immaculate Reception for Franco Harris's yeah. famous match. And he was just a real charismatic, funny guy. You hear his voice once, you will never confuse him with anybody else. Uh, and I'm starting to work on a biography about him. Um, oh, that's great. I'm hoping you know, that uh, that might be another year or two away, but I'm hoping that eventually finds an audience. And uh, I just, you know, I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm going to keep doing yeah. it. Well, come back when you got that book done. And uh, in the meantime, stand by for a sec. Let me wrap this thing up. <laughs>